guys, welcome back. Um, all of my favorite people here. It's September the 3rd. It's time to open our next bottle. Um, really late here in Hong Kong as well after midnight. So I um, have picked another Italian wine and even more so another uh, wine from Piemont. So this is a Coli Tortonesi uh, Timoraso. So Coli Tortonesi is the name of the DOC. It's a very small appellation in the southeast of Piemont. Um, the grape is Timoraso. And then the producer is, I've written it down, for some reason I'm struggling to pronounce it, Oltre Trente. Oltre Trente. Um, so it's a white wine from Piemont, and I thought it would be kind of cool to see two indigenous grape varieties from the region. Obviously, Piemont is one of um, Italy's biggest uh, wine producing regions. And Timorasa is arguably the hottest white grape in Italy right now. It's like suddenly popping up here, or there, everywhere. It's super, super trendy. Um, very small production still, so it's just about 30 producers. It's actually quite similar to Voltolina, right? What we were talking about yesterday. I think Voltolina is like 30 to 40 producers, if I remember correctly. And Timorasa is just there at the moment. So that's a very uh, small, niche, unique wine, but it has some characteristics that I'll talk about later that are very unique. I just realized I should probably open it. And um, it almost is like, it's the same story as with most indigenous grapes. So I've just passed this very difficult VA exam uh, in Italy Academy for uh, Italian wine ambassador. And they made us study a hundred indigenous grapes from Italy in like pretty, you know, pretty minutiae, small detail. And every grape you pick beyond, you know, the obvious 10 in Italy has the same story. It's like, well, it's a low productivity grape. It's a grape that was difficult to grow. So, you know, when people were relying on, when the climate was less reliable and people are uh, financially, were financially depending on um, their wine sales, they of course were going for higher yielding, more uh, consistent grape varieties and all of this um, kind of more interesting, I guess, grapes have fallen into obscurity. Timor Rasa specifically was just revived in the 80s by a winemaker, pretty much single-handedly uh, resurrected the grape, uh, Walter Massa. Uh, still remains one of the coolest references for this grape. If you, if you ever see it, I highly recommend. Um, the other one that I've discovered Timor Rasa very recently, and so the other one that I've come across uh, was uh, Colombera by Lisa Simino and it blew my mind because it kind of started like with the coolest mine that there is probably in the region um, and it was um, Columbera Dirthona so Dirthona is like a small area uh, in Koli uh, Tortonese DFC and um, it was a single vineyard Alyssa Semina and it was a very like not very but it was like an older vintage 2015 I believe and it just blew my mind. I had it in like a random Italian wine tasting and I just like kept <laughs> staring at the glass. It was like, wait, what? <laughs> I don't understand. What is this magic? Um, wow, you could see the color. It's quite golden, intensely colored. And uh, let's... Oh, interesting. So this one is... Um, by a kind of like a smaller up and coming producer. I think they have like three, four hectares in uh, uh, the area. They also do Barbera that looks really cool, like old wine Barbera on their on peripheral of sewer roads um, and Dolcetto. And I think they have Favorita and Cortez of Land as well in whites. Um, this is 2020 vintage, so I didn't know how developed or complex it has gotten so far. Um, I, yeah, I think Timor Vaso is kind of, not unlike Shannon or Riesling, um, it really shines with age. 
Um, but again, because it's such an obscure grave, it's so hard to come by, you know, like, be happy with whatever vintage you, ha you, you manage to get your hands on. Um, so the key characteristics of Tumorvasu are, are really high acidity. So this is where this Shani and, and Riesling uh, resemblance come into play. So high acidity, uh, complexity in terms of like flavor, um, very intense development with age. Um, and also like in terms of acidity for me, and this is how I, I mean, this is like super advanced knowledge and it's very subjective. So <laughs> if everyone would feel the same way, but um, in like professional circles, if you have to taste something blind, um, you know, like you go through the grid and it's like, well, the color is this, the acidity is this, the tannin is this, and you usually specify quantity. So like acidity is higher, acidity, acidity is medium plus, so the kind of things that you may hear people say. If you want to move one step ahead of that, you can also start thinking about the quality of those characteristics. So acidity is high, but how does it develop on the palate? And this is where, you know, people who like don't work with wine professionally find that it's like a big, uh, you know, pile of mumbo jumbo. But in like, if you do actually pay attention and you spend your time doing it, there is logic to it. So when people talk about things like the shape of acidity or the <laughs> texture of tannin, um, there is legit um, sensations that you can pick up while tasting. So shape of acidity and like this is for me how i pick pick out timorous and blinds um you can imagine your palate having like three key points in time as it as it's experiencing wine so on entry mid palate and kind of aftertaste so you have three points where you can measure your sensation of acidity and it turns out that once you start thinking about this way, um, different wines show differently. Like Riesling almost has this like pulsing acidity that like comes and goes. Um, some wines have like very sturdy line. Um, you know, there are many ways this could go, but <laughs> specifically with Timor Rasso and uh, Chenin Blanc, it's um, this kind of crescendo shape where it grows. Like as it sits on your palate and as you swallow it, it kind of like, it's called crescendo, yeah, so like it, it, it increases. So whenever, I mean, obviously I look at other things as well, but like whenever I have this sensation and blind, I'm always thinking, oh, is it Timorasso, is it potentially Shannon? And then Timorasso is also um, quite herbaceous and uh, mineral, whatever the hell that is, we'll try to decide this, this specific one. Um, could have quite a lot of fruit, especially in a seed, but like the, another character that makes it quite similar to Riesling is this thing that is called TDM, um, which is a group of compounds, uh, norisoprenoids they're called, um, that are uh, aromatic precursors in the berries of the grapes. And precursors means that they only express themselves under certain conditions. And with TDN, it's specifically uh, water stress and sunburn. So you can kind of, once you sense it on the palate, and on the palate it shows as kerosene petrol notes. So again, if you've ever tried um, bracelet, especially recently, it's actually a big issue in um, Germany at the moment for bracelet producers, because too much TDN could almost verge onto a fault. And um, they are like working different ways, trying to protect the grape bunches from sun exposure to not get that burn and not get that much TDN or kerosene petrol on the palate because it could clash with fruit. Uh, and not everyone finds it, you know, attractive. Um, <laughs> Darren roses and Nebbiolo, you know, kerosene in uh, uh, Timorasa, it's mm, strange, strange wines. People call Timorasa an intellectual wine, and whenever I read it, I always like make a mental note. It's like, it's an acquired taste. It's the kind of wine that, if you're just a beginner wine drinker, you may not necessarily appreciate. And I say that because I have been that beginner drinker. 
and I think my journey through in wine started with wines that were more fruity at first. Um, so, you know, you take some really big, fruity, sweet Shiraz and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this wine tastes like plums and spices and like, what is this wonderful thing? Um, then I think the second wave of like my thinking about wine was nature wine. And again, it's like not having enough understanding or not having enough exposure in terms of flavors. You almost like geek out about the funkiest and flawless wine there is. You're like, oh my God, this is weird. This tastes different, you know, from the supermarket wine I used to drink before. Um, and like, it's totally, totally normal. I do understand the appeal. I've been that girl. And like walking into a bar and be like, yeah, what's your funkiest wine today? And then I guess like as you study more, maybe as you drink more and your palate matures, you kind of start appreciating wines that are a little bit cleaner and more balanced. And then, uh, yeah, and then you can start appreciating wines that have less fruit and more complexity and more kind of less aromatically um, present and maybe a little bit more in the palate, which is what a lot of Italian whites are. They're like quintessentially back palate wines. Um, and a lot of people coming from, you know, drinking white burgundy or like German Rieslings, they kind of feel a little bit lost in Italy. Um, and to their, in, in their defense, a lot of Italian wines were historically quite, you know, bland, acidic and blah. Um, another, you know, white wine from Piemont is Gavi which is made from Cortese grape. Um, and yeah, that one I'm not a huge fan of, like occasionally you get a bottle with a little bit more complexity, but it's a kind of like very transparent wine, but not much character in my opinion. Uh, so there are these wines that Saabe used to be like that, but I think now the global warming, it's like turning out more and more intense and complex and beautiful wines. Uh, so yeah, so Tamaraso is not bad, I think it has a lot going on the palate, it's a slightly tannic uh, white grape variety, like we don't normally think about tannin in white grapes, but uh, there is some, you know, <laughs> not in every grape, uh, but some wines, white wines are famously tannic, like Anzonica from, uh, from Italy as well, or, you know, Fiano, um, and Tamaraso is like, considered to be lightly tannic. It also turns quite big alcohol wines, and like if I swirl it in a glass, I can kind of almost see the viscosity, like the liquid is swirling a little bit slower. So again, in a blind tasting, I'd be like, huh, either high sugar content or alcohol or both. You know, pretty, pretty neutral nose, like it's, it's not shy. It's like a little bit of honey, a little bit of waxiness, a little bit of queens, maybe lemon rind. Uh, flowers, yeah, it's kind of, it's very floral, red flowers. Oh, wow. Um, it's definitely more, um, I was a little bit worried when I saw it 2020, because I am um, in my head, another Italian grape variety, actually just to run that discussion about Tidian and Petrol, I was saying Riesling, but the other varieties that famously have perceptible um, quantities of Tidian, uh, Formint from Hungary or Cazzatelli, uh, well, mostly from Georgia, Eastern Europe, you can say broadly. And then it's Caricante in Etna and uh, Timaraso. So, ah, uh, Fiano as well in Campania. So three Italian uh, white grapes uh, famously have that quality. And, um, but it can only show with time. Again, like it's, it's that tricky thing. It's like a little bit of it adds complexity. It's like with bread in Syrah, it's like technically it's a fold. But a little bit of, of it almost makes Northern Rhone Syrahs. It's the same thing with Tidian. It's like too much of it and it's kind of wah, but a little bit of it is nice. And I'm just linking it in my head to White Etna from the same vintage that I think 
it was a beautiful wine but just like needed more time to develop i think this drinks beautifully now i definitely feel the alcohol like 14 percent alcohol is a lot for a weight I feel subtle tannin, I feel a lot of herbs, like dried herbs, maybe like oregano, some sort of like roots, um, almost like if you walk through a field, you know, like on a sunny day in autumn when the sun has uh, lifted all of the aromatics in the air. Uh, very good fruit concentration, um, high acidity, so like I'm still, <laughs> my mouth almost is still salivating. Um, it's a beautiful, and it, it has this like a very interesting texture. So it's like it gives you like almost like a full mouthfeel because of alcohol, because of the tannin. So it's it's a very it's it's a big wine, but it's not overly fruity. So if, I wouldn't say that fruit is a dominant character. Whereas like something like Fiano, I would expect, you know, much more to be much more fruit forward. So for me, this makes it attractive because it, it like. It's not overly sim simple, I guess. The producer, sorry, before we move on. Um, Oltre Torrente uh, apparently translates as the other stream or beyond current. It's a young couple. Well, young, I guess, they're there. Late 30s, they were fairly young when they started the vineyard in 2010. Um, completely organic agriculture and kind of leaning more towards biodynamic, um, very hands off, you know, terroir driven um, production. So, like everything, again, everything I appreciate. Indigenous yeast, it's unplanned, unfiltered. Um, this is cluster crushed, so they don't remove the berries from the stems, and this is where the stems that the clusters are structured around is where um, a lot of tannin is. So if you don't destem, you end up getting more of that tannic quality in wine. And for those who may not know how to describe tannin, it's if you're a tea drinker, that's like that sensation of bitterness, dryness that is left on the palate, astringent, astringency it's also called. Um, for me, it's a sign of complexity. Um, I, I like I like that in red wines. I like I like that in white wines. Obviously, not always, but this kind of like sensation of bitterness and like texture friction on the palate that comes from tannin. And I guess that's for a different video. Like we can talk about tannin and like what physically um, happens in your mouth and what kind of chemistry happens in your mouth when you taste wine because actually what you're drinking is not what's in the glass <laughs> that was a big discovery for me uh, as i was studying wine uh, what are you drinking is uh, significantly more gross than this visually um, because a lot of compounds um, are reacting with your saliva as you drink uh, and they turn this liquid that you like visually see into a very clumpy kind of goopy type of a thing so there is actually like if you if, if you were to get any red wine with tannin and instead of like swishing it around in your mouth and instead of swallowing it spit it out in a cup where you could see it and let it sit there for a second coagulate together you'll visually see that it's very very different from what you have in the glass so when people talk about texture of tannin that's the texture that they're talking about there is this physical sensation of texture and some wines string you know tannin string together as some of them clump so we can talk about you know silky tannins or sandy tannins or uh, a million other things again it's like besides the point this is only like valuable really for blind tasting but i do find like when i first discovered that <laughs> what i'm actually swallowing is not what i'm putting in my mouth i was like wow that's actually kind of interesting it makes a lot of sense I love the honey sensation in this as well. It's really, really nice. Wow. And acidity, 
it's not an oppressive acidity so when i say hi like uh, there are some wines that are like oh my god like i feel like an enamel is coming off my teeth it's not that at all it's just like pleasantly present throughout which makes it a lively wine and lighter wine at 14 percent alcohol I, I think it's i think it's really cool i would love again this is the kind of wine that you want to have with food i would love to have it with like steamed white fish or chicken or you know i think it would go really well with like spiced full of flavor cuisine as well because it's like it's a fairly big wine that has some complexity and uh, structure to support bigger dishes very 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 cool i highly recommend that you guys seek out timuras if you see it on them um, on the list in a bar somewhere or um happen to come across a bottle of very interesting grape to, to try um, I guess, like I was saying, it's like becoming more and more fashionable. The Yeti, who is one of the you know, bigger, more famous uh, Barolo producers in Piedmont, were looking to make a second white wine and they picked Timorasso. So even like the big boys are starting to move into this grape as they recognize the complexity, the potential that there is. Okay, what should we pair this with literature wise? I have cheated. I'm not doing this one on the spot. I kind of, when I saw what the name of the winery translates to, Oto Torrente, um, the other stream beyond the current, I'm thinking of rivers. I think river did come up um, in the Google Translate. And I immediately had this quote pop up in my mind from Kazu Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. Um, so Kazuo Shiguro is a British writer. He was born in Nagasaki and then grew up in like rural England. Um, he has won a Booker Prize. Salman Rushdie praised his writing. Um, Never Let Me Go was named like in top hundred, I think, best novels of the century by the Time magazine. Um, I do actually always keep some of his <laughs> writing on hand. I'm currently halfway through Clara and the Sun. Um, Kazuo Shiguro is like an interesting writer. He really takes it out of you in a very subtle way. He is very... It's like soul crushing, uh, but it's like it creeps and creeps. Like <laughs> There is no like big rupture or big drama. It's like this almost like you know pleasant sensation of like something something's about to happen and usually it's not a big thing um and i don't know like when i finished never let me go it took me apart and I, it still stands as one of the best books i've ever read and uh, but it took me a few like a year and a half to get through it because that feeling of like oh my god i think something bad like something bad is going to happen prevented me from picking it up and the same is happening with Clara and the Sun so I'm like I'm a little bit through it um, and I, I need to get back to it. Adam also gifted me a couple An Artist of the Floating World and Nocturnes. I haven't read this two yet um, and yes and famously like many would be familiar with uh, Kazuo Shigure's work from the movie and the book uh, the Remains of the Day, Anthony Hopkins uh, is playing in it. It's a beautiful, both actually, <laughs> a rare case, but both uh, the book and the movie are fantastic um, and very meditative and uh, glorious. So <clears throat> the most iconic quote from Never Let Me Go is this river imagery. I'm going to read it off my laptop. I keep thinking about this river somewhere with the water moving really fast and there's two people in the water trying to hold on to each other, holding on as hard as they can. But in the end, it's just too much. The current is too strong. They've got to let go, drift apart. That's how it is with us. It's a shame, Kat, because we've loved each other all our lives. But in the end, we can't stay together forever. So I think it's this. Beautiful image, and I, I often think about it visually. It doesn't have to just 
involve people, you know, that you meet and you split paths with. It could be hobbies and dreams and plans and whatnot. And whenever you reconnect with someone, or I often think about it in traveling as well, it's like, oh, you come to a city where you had a really good time and, you know, you're living it and you never know if you're ever going to be back again. Whenever you come back again, you get a chance to visit. It's like, yeah, you're floating in this river and it's like, oh, <laughs> you managed to grasp onto something. What a magic, uh, what a magic occasion. To top it off though, um, equally, I was amazed by this piece of critique that was written on this book and I'll try to sell it to you <laughs> if you haven't read uh, using this quote. It's by John Harrison. It's a piece that was published in The Guardian. And I think it's just very beautiful in its own right. So what is Never Let Me Go really about? It's about the steady erosion of hope. It's about repressing what you know, which is that in this life, people fail one another, grow old and fall to pieces. It's about knowing that while you must keep calm, keeping calm won't change a thing. Never Let Me Go makes you want to have sex, take drugs, run a marathon, dance, anything to convince yourself that you're more alive, more determined, more conscious, more dangerous than any of these characters. This extraordinary and, in the end, rather frighteningly clever novel is about why we don't explode, why we don't wake up one day and go sobbing and crying down in the street, kicking everything to pieces out of the raw, infuriating, completely personal sense of our lives never having been what they could have been. I think he captured the idea of the book because there are two ways to look at it. You can look at it as a love story. And I guess that's what this quote about the river is kind of pointing at. And uh, it's a classic story to people realizing that their message for each other way too late in life. Or you could look at it, and I guess that's why it had such a profound impression on me as this kind of existential drama. It's really about our denial um, of death and our own mortality and all of the other crazy things that we don't have any power over, you know? Anyway, something to think about. <laughs>